Okay, well now it's my pleasure to welcome our next uh, speaker, Professor Iona Novak, a professor of cerebral palsy. So Iona is a Fulbright scholar who's established Accelerate, an American-Australian cerebral palsy stem cell research consortium that pulls collective effort, efforts to find a cure. Iona has pursued projects and roles with the greatest possible impact on children and their families, including co-founding the Australian Cerebral Palsy Register and developing clinical practice guidelines to diagnose cerebral palsy early, define best practice, early intervention and interventions that improve independence. She's really got a fantastic track record in generating and translating new cerebral palsy intervention knowledge, including randomised controlled trials, systematic reviews, She's been involved in big data establishment and analysis. She's co-founder of the Australian Cerebral Palsy Register, which is linked to registers worldwide. She's built collective research networks, including her work on Accelerate, and she's translated research into practice really through her clinical trials and evidence-based practice. And that's led to changes in clinical care in many countries around the world. So I'd like to welcome Iona to the symposium and I'm looking forward to a talk, Lost in Translation, Uncovering Rosetta Stones. Thanks, Iona. Thank you very much, Matthew, for that warm introduction. I'll just share some slides. <laughs> So the facts are that it takes a good 17 years to take something from the bench through to clinical practice. And so for me that work with children, that's a whole childhood. And even then only 14% of discoveries actually make it into clinical care. And the wait for parents and children seems too long. And at times it seems too long for us as researchers. Here's the bone marrow story. It took 50 years from the initial report to get it through into clinical trials and into routine practice. And there are still families even now wondering if umbilical cord blood might be a helpful treatment for cerebral palsy. And even then, if you're lucky enough, like our last speaker, to discover a new treatment, it takes another 10 to 20 years to implement research into clinical practice. That's a second whole childhood. But do these delays really matter? Is this just how long research takes? Well, here's a startling fact from the pediatric literature. A systematic review showed that amongst American, Australian and British children, 50,000 children died before we implemented the back to sleep program of sleeping children on their back. And here's an example from my field. I work with children with cerebral palsy. Worldwide, one in three have a hip dislocation as a complication of their cerebral palsy. Our colleagues in Sweden have managed to almost achieve zero hip dislocations. In fact, there's one case in Sweden and it was someone that immigrated there. And how have they done that? They've done it through the right treatments to the right people at the right time. We're still working on this practice lag here in Australia and in other places. So for me, knowledge translation is a bit like finding a Rosetta Stone. It's the way to translate between different end users. But for me, it's much more than just decryption. I really like this definition. It's my favourite. Knowledge is like fine wine. The researcher brews it, the scientific paper bottles it, the peer reviewer tastes it, and the journal sticks a label on it. And the archive system carefully stores it in a cellar. But there's just one problem. Wine is only useful when somebody's drinking it. Wine in a bottle does not quench your thirst. Knowledge translation opens the bottle, pours the wine and serves it. So let me pour you some wine. I'd like to tell you three stories about the progress being made in the field of cerebral palsy. Let's start with these translational gaps. So we start thinking about translation across T1 to T4, and these are sometimes called the valleys of death, trying to get something from discovery into clinical use. So we'll look at some examples. So first of all, what is a known Rosetta Stone is to involve consumers. And in our field, we interviewed and surveyed families about their research priorities and our entire research agenda is matched to their priorities. One of the things that they asked us in a courageous way is that could stem cells have a therapeutic effect for cerebral palsy? 
Now, for those of you that don't know much about this condition, it actually has no known cure. So this was a very big scientific question they were proposing. The second Rosetta Stone was, could we uh, build knowledge translation or translational networks to accelerate this pipeline. So one of the things that I was fortunate enough to do with my Fulbright scholarship was build a translational network between North America and Australia to accelerate bench to bedside stem cell therapies for children with cerebral palsy. It's known as the Accelerate Network. The third Rosetta Stone is to involve clinician scientists. And that's because you always get better clinical application when something comes from the bench to the human. And I'll give you an example of that in the stem cell theory. So let's just say in a particular stem cell line we've been working with, we knew the effective dose in the animal model, we knew the effective dose in an adult. But when you start thinking about implanting these cells to children, they're much smaller humans. And so the volume could actually create an injury if you directly implanted them into the brain. So then your obvious logical conclusion is, well, we'll just increase the concentration and half the volume. But then you run into other problems thinking, about, well, would this uh, shorter, more concentrated volume go through the delivery needle because these cells are sticky? So you have to keep having this dance between clinicians and scientists to actually get something from the bench to the bedside. The next Rosetta Stone is to involve industry. And we know that the pipeline moves eight times faster when you have an industry partner. And that's because they have financial acumen, they can think about the product to market aspects. So it's very important we include industry in our partnerships. So we've been doing this work in cerebral palsy and stem cell to try and answer this question. I'll show you what impact we've had. First of all, in this group of work, we've been able to demonstrate that stem cells are safe for children with cerebral palsy. This is a meta-analysis we conducted. And in addition, we were also able to show that they confer small improvements in movement, larger than those experienced by rehabilitation alone. So this says that they're a promising treatment and more research is worthwhile. Next, through our partnership with the cell care company, they funded a pro bono sibling banking program. And why would you do this? Well, obviously you might start with autologous, your own cord blood as a treatment for stem cells, but there's no pre-birth test for cerebral palsy. So most people don't know that they might want to store their cord blood. So a sibling bank uh, allows for good matched cords. Using these cords, we were able to go to human trial and we've completed Australia's first ever stem cell trial for cerebral palsy, demonstrating safety of sibling cord blood. Now to in illustrate the next point that I wanna make about impact, I'll just show you this traffic light system we invented that we use for knowledge translation. Anything color coded a green light intervention is something that's been proven to work in a clinical trial or a randomized trial and a, or a systematic review. Red is the exact opposite. It confers harm or has no benefit, and yellow is everything else for multiple reasons. So what we were able then to do is aggregate all the data worldwide about children with cerebral palsy. And we were able to allocate now a green light to umbilical cord blood for children with cerebral palsy, because we know that these cells are safe and they confer movement gains. These are some of the other cell lines that we're thinking about, mesenchymal stem cells, neural stem cells, and bone marrow stem cells. However, not every family is in the position to perhaps have another baby for the purpose of saving a sibling cord blood. And certainly as researchers, that's not something we wanted to promote. So we next wanted to test whether unrelated donor cord blood was safe. And we've been able to do that and show that it is safe, which now opens the field wide open for allergen A examples, which improves the feasibility of this intervention for cerebral palsy. The next thing that we did was actually look at the total effort of the cerebral palsy stem cell research field. So you can see down the left hand side five different uh, types of cell preparations that we might be considering for cerebral palsy. And across the, across the top of this slide, you can see the different points on the translational pathway uh, when working with humans. And what you might notice looking along here, if you take your eyes to the bottom right hand corner, more than 2,400 children have now had 
stem cells uh, if they have cerebral palsy in a clinical trial. And that's a lot more than what people expect me to say. They often say, oh, we're not there yet, more research is needed. But actually, this is a really large number and it, it's equivalent or greater than two of the biggest, most researched interventions in cerebral palsy. So a precedent has been set and we need to keep moving. But I want to draw your eye to the red arrow at the phase three level. So you can see there's been a lot of work done in the phase one and phase two space, but very little done at the phase three space. So we've now been working with the Royal College who are about to put out a statement saying that a phase three trial is absolutely necessary uh, using cord blood for children with cerebral palsy to move the needle towards regulatory approval in this country. We've been working with the public to garner interest. A lot of this work is very expensive to conduct and the funding sources are often philanthropic. And I'd like to thank Dr. Matthew Keenan for his role in this. We held a summit and a public forum looking at this issue and were able to lobby uh, for the release of cord blood samples from the public bank for research purposes. And that's been a successful collaborative endeavor. But of course, if this intervention works in a condition like cerebral palsy, which mostly starts during pregnancy and you're treating children years after their brain injury who do have neuroinflammation like our last speaker was talking about, of course, the questions that come to mind as a researcher is what about bigger doses and what about earlier treatment? And this has led us to be able to get to human trial in preterm babies. So preterm babies have uh, constitute 40% of all children with cerebral palsy and we're now doing an autonomy infusion uh, back to see the effects and we found that it's feasible to do so this will allow us to next move to other cell lines so if we move now along this pipeline to thinking about how do we bridge this idea of the research practice gap for humans how do we get things from clinical practice into policy I'll talk to this second story. So theoretically, the textbook some time ago said that cerebral palsy was an unpreventable condition. The rate of cerebral palsy was stable for 60 years worldwide with some fluctuations based on changes in medical care, but basically the same. Using a combination of techniques, I'd like to acknowledge our collaborators in Adelaide, New Zealand. They used a complex program of audit and feedback to clinicians about adopting some of the newer evidence-based prevention interventions for cerebral palsy, some of the green light interventions. We also, together with them, had an extensive worldwide media campaign about the use of a product called magnesium sulfate, which can actually prevent as much as 30% of cerebral palsy when given to a mother just prior to the imminent delivery of a baby with, um, who is going to be born preterm. And it can prevent cerebral palsy and can also prevent death. So we had a long campaign with the media and, and journalists love a good news story and they love a scandal. So they, we would tell them there's good news that there was this intervention magnesium magnesium sulfate that could be used to prevent cerebral palsy and then sort of allude to the possible scandal that they could follow you know what if people weren't using it and then they'd of course ring us and ask for the names of the hospitals which we never gave them but they started ringing hospitals and hospitals really actually got involved in this program with collaborators and took the rate of implementation up. So what has been that impact? So you can see there I've got a magnesium sulfate is a green light intervention and antenatal corticosteroids are also a green light intervention. And what these researchers in Adelaide did was shift the rate of the use of magnesium sulfate in Australia from under 2% to over 90% in two years. So they substantially reduced that 10 to 20 year lag that we typically see. In addition, we have these two other very important preventative interventions for cerebral palsy in the neonatal period, one of them being hypothermia, so a full body cooling that lowers the chance of a brain injury for one in six, and then caffeine to uh, assist with apnea treatment, but all can also assist with protection of white matter. And what has this done at a total population level? Well, you can see after the uh, standard implementation of these four major interventions, particularly magnesium sulfate, we saw a staggering 30% reduction in the incidence of cerebral palsy. Australia now has the lowest incidence of cerebral palsy worldwide. And this is really the power of a collaborative effort of working with people with cerebral palsy or consumers, working with clinicians, working with researchers and working with policymakers. 
This has, means that in Australia this year, 200 families won't have a child with cerebral palsy, and it has already conferred over $2 billion in savings to our country. So let's move on to this third story. Cerebral palsy was typically diagnosed late, around the 19 month or somewhere between 12 and 24 months. Now, if you had a stroke after this talk and you went to the hospital next door, RPA, an excellent hospital, and they said, right, let's just leave that a couple of years and see how you go with that. And you could come back and see if there's any problems. You'd be horrified with the hospital. And in fact, this is what we were accidentally doing to children with cerebral palsy, having a brain injury during pregnancy and then starting treatment. Some 19 months later. We wanted to see if we could move the needle on this. So here are some of the KT or Rosetta Stone strategies that we use that are green lights. One of them was building a clinical practice guideline that had reminders for decision making. And this intervention was published in JAMA Pediatrics, and it was a worldwide effort with consumers, with uh, all the clinicians you would expect to have involved in the diagnosis, and researchers. And together, we were able to map out which tests were most likely to diagnose cerebral palsy early and accurately, uh, and we were able to move and suggest that the diagnosis could be made at three months of age. We also use a whole range of other knowledge translation techniques. So the first one up there in the top corner is that finances often is a barrier to people using evidence. And in this case, one of the tests in our guideline required you to pay for training. And so we uh, invented scholarships for people to overcome that barrier. Another one was confidence in using these tests. They weren't widely used in Australia or uh, outside of Europe. And so we had a special interest group that built this peer reviewed confidence in using these tools. Another barrier was that, oh, that's not what we do here at our hospital, and actually training extraordinary opinion leaders in Australia who led this change amongst clinicians and gave them confidence to do this and implement these new tests. And then another barrier can be, well, not everybody's trained, and using the media can be an incredibly important way to actually get adaptation and change in practice by accessing all levels of the pipeline, so including bottom-up strategies that inform parents. So we can tell you a funny story. One day we had a call from a mother who said, I would like to have this test, the general movements test. Um, and I said, wow, you have a really up-to-date pediatrician that's recommended you come and talk to us. Oh, that's not how I found you, she said. I saw you guys in the Women's Weekly and I want that test. And I told my pediatrician that's what I want. So kind of humorous. I never really pictured myself or ever aspired to be in the Women's Weekly. But these sorts of knowledge translation techniques can be incredibly powerful for informing consumers who can also drive evidence to practice changes. Another thing that we know works, another Rosetta Stone or a green light treatment for uh, improving knowledge translation is to involve families. And patient mediated help is the term used in the knowledge translation literature. But in this case, this general movements test that we've been talking about, one of the key tests for an early diagnosis, it's actually a test taken by video and scored from video. So one of the things that was done was we funded another collaborator in Melbourne to build an app which parents could use to video their child. So as you can see on screen there, it had instructions with the little dotted line of how close they had to have the camera to the baby and how long, and then they had an upload procedure. And that allowed them to assist with this process of this uptake of the tool because people could say, well, I, oh, we didn't actually have time to video the child. Well, in fact, the parent had done that step. So that was fantastic. And what did this do? What did this change? So we also opened a clinic in Sydney to look at uh, whether we could close this practice gap, whether we could fully implement this guideline. And we chose a lower socioeconomic area where it was difficult for patients to afford private neurology services or private pediatric services. And what we found here is that we actually lowered the age from up in the 19 month sort of range down to four and a half months for identification of high risk of cerebral palsy. And these were definitely confirmed at eight and a half months of age. So you can see we really moved the needle back closer to the timing of the brain injury or the brain abnormality. And this is incredibly important. So when we go back to that first story about stem cells and we think, well, it does work late, but it might be better to start things early Earlier, having an early accurate diagnosis that you can recruit children to trials with homogeneity is very, very important for using some of these novel agents very early.
But most importantly for us, this early diagnosis, diagnosis is not a destination, it's a gateway. And for 100% of the children that went through this process where we adopted the guideline, 100% of them got to early intervention. And we're proud that we've been able to work with the National Disability Insurance Scheme in Australia to change the intake criteria to allow for children to have an early diagnosis or high risk of cerebral palsy and access early intervention funds, not when they're close to two, but much, much earlier in their life to optimise their outcome and neuroplasticity. So I'm going to conclude here. I've got three main messages. So the number one is that the Rosetta Stone that really works is to involve end users. Some of those bold questions they set in that Delphi survey about could stem cells make a difference? And everyone was a little bit worried, was this too ambitious? It turns out they were right. They also wanted to know, could you prevent cerebral palsy? And it turns out if we collaborate, you definitely can. We've seen a 30% reduction in the rate and more is possible. So it's very important that when we're thinking about translational research and knowledge to practice gaps that we do apply effective Rosetta Stones. We know that leaving it to goodwill certainly doesn't work alone. We have to be very intentional and active in our efforts to actually close knowledge to practice gaps. And of course, the third and the most important point is that when we do this, patients and families are the winner. And I hope that you can see that from our data today. Thank you very much. Well, thanks, Iona, for a really wonderful tour. We enjoyed uh, hearing about your fine wine collection. And I think really seeing the fantastic translation of research into this reduction in 30% of 30% cerebral palsy worldwide, which is really a fantastic achievement by uh, yourself and extended network of researchers. So, so well done. We have uh, some time uh, for questions. I suppose uh, just at a, a simple level, like why why does cord blood work? Like what, what's what's going on? Interesting question, Matthew. Thank you. Cord blood is a multi-cell source and it has a number of properties. Uh, stem cells can do three jobs and umbilical cord blood has two properties which we think are very helpful. First of all, it decreases inflammation. So like our previous speaker, we now know that inflammation persists for at least four years um, in cerebral palsy. And so it has a neuroinflammatory um, dampening effect, which is very, very important. The other thing that it does is it has a trophic effect. So it stimulates other aspects of the brain to begin and initiate natural repair processes. So for example, it could stimulate um, angiogenesis, so making more blood vessels close to the sites of the injury and assisting with rewiring. So it has its own sort of trophic effects. Those are the main two effects we've seen in um, preclinical work and we see carry out uh, with children. So it is an interesting thing. We have split the cord blood apart to see whether one cell line in there was more potent than the other and should we just be using that? But it turns out in the sheet model that actually the whole cord blood and the interaction of these cells is actually incredibly important. So whole cord blood seems to work better than isolating the components of cord blood. Of course, the next steps, if you were going forward, is we've managed to think about unrelated donors, which makes this a much more feasible treatment. And fortunately for children with cerebral palsy, they have a normal immune system, so you don't need immunosuppression. But of course, what you really want is an off-the-shelf product that you don't have to get out of a bank and um, expanding these cells and that sort of work is underway and we're just testing um, clinical potency and comparability of these to whole cold blood right now. And you mentioned the diagnostic delay of like 19 months. I suppose with all of the now awareness and research, where is, where is the delay? What's the delay estimated at in Australia but also internationally? Yeah, so we can see in these cohorts that have definitely applied it. So in our clinic group at Monash at Children's Hospital where they've applied it and a big network in us um, coming out of Ohio in the United States, we can see that the, uh, the diagnostic uh, timing is under six months of age and that's what we really want because in the human we believe the corticospinal tract completes connection at around the six month mark and we do see from other clinical trials that starting motor interventions before six months of age has a substantially better outcome than starting late so this early diagnosis is really pleasing we're starting to see a trend in many other uh, locations of people starting to adopt it and we hope uh, in future we're doing some work with the register obviously we confirm cases later on so the register data lags a little bit behind but uh, we would hope to see a population impact here. <laughs>
Uh, Leanne Tors asked, um, early diagnosis is critical for early intervention. Have you also focused your work towards baby health clinic nurses and general practitioners, given that these are often the healthcare workers most involved with early management? Thanks, Leanne. That's a really great question. We have tiered our approaches. So 50% uh, of all children with cerebral palsy uh, go through a neonatal intensive care unit. So we initially focused our efforts there. We have now moved out to uh, community-based paediatricians and uh, are hoping now to work with nurses and GPs. There are certainly um, educational offerings for those people. We're about through the Royal College to launch an e-learning program for people that would like to learn how to make these early diagnoses. But we're also working with the federal government on whether we can have a public health initiative that would work for uh, screening whole total population populations because some of these babies are easy to find they have a complex medical history and we have great concerns about them but 50 percent of them have a healthy pregnancy and a seemingly normal birth and it's the parents and the the nurses that are detecting these problems. So yes, we need very specific strategies for them uh, because they tend to be diagnosed later, those children. So we need um, really a universal screening program in this country to make that happen. And if you could put your sort of future uh, glasses on, where would you see this field in five years time and perhaps also in 50 years time? Wonderful question. In five years time, I think we will have a clinical treatment that is proven that reduces the size of a brain injury and therefore improves function and independence or lowers the severity of cerebral palsy. In 50 years time, I wonder if there will be any people with cerebral palsy because prevention efforts are so extraordinary. But if there are, I think we'll definitely have a cure for them. Well, thanks, Ayana. It was really a fantastic example of translational medicine research and improved outcomes for, for patients and their extended families. So, so well done and really fantastic. Thank you. Thank you.